Hello, good afternoon, everybody. This is, for those who didn't realise, this is the Environment and Waste Management Group, uh, one of our hopefully fortnightly or every three weeks um, webinars for people around the world, for all our members and anyone with an interest in any of our topics. It's not just environment, it's not just waste management, it can be aspects of other businesses and other sectors where, where the green agenda comes to play or where waste is produced or where people have concerns with utilities and whatever. So, and we are looking for speakers in any area to come forward in contact to through our LinkedIn page and we have to talk to you to give some exposure to yourselves. That also can go towards your CPD as well for actually doing a presentation. And it'd be great to put up a broader network of people across a number of sectors under our broad umbre umbrella. The membership of the IHEWMG is at least 10,000 members of IOSH, which is quite was the second largest group, I believe, to construction. So today's session, today's speaker, Kate Lane, she's a programme manager of the Zero Emissions Areas Programme at C40 Cities Climate Leadership. She convenes a network of transport decision makers delivering strategies and interventions to encourage citizens to make better decisions about how they move around cities. This means providing people with more transport options and making it easy for people to make choices that will most benefit public health, social equity and significantly reduce climate emissions. Kate leads C40's work with cities designing and implementing zero emissions areas. To date, 30 mayors have signed the C40 Green and Healthy Streets Declaration, pledging to transform urban mobility in line with commitments of the Paris Agreement. Prior to joining C40 Cities, Kate worked in development consulting with a focus on supporting African cities respond to urbanisation and climate change. Kate has a bachelor's in politics, philosophy and economics and a master's in economics from University College London and quite a comprehensive LinkedIn profile as well, I'll add. So hopefully, please make contact with her. Please enjoy the next 35, 40 minutes. We'll take your questions as we, at the end, those that I, we can't pick off um, by text replies afterwards, but please hear the full presentation really because your questions that you asked early on might be answered later on. So Kate, the floor is yours. Welcome. Sorry, I just had to try and find the unmute button. Thanks very much, David and the IOSH team for having me uh, present today. And thank you to everyone who has tuned in. Um, so a really helpful introduction. I work for a, an organization called C40 Cities Climate Leadership. Um, you can be forgiven if you're not really aware of us. We are very well known to mayors uh, and probably the mayor in the city where you are based right now. Um, and we're less well known uh, to the general public. And the reason for this is because we are best described as a, a climate lobbying organization um, that works as a sort of private mayor's club. So to give you a bit of background, um, our mission and purpose is to uh, convene glo le leading global cities so they can lead on climate action. Um, so we are a collection of the world's leading megacities. We have 97 member cities. We represent megacities, so the, the general rule of thumb is if your city is a population of 3 million or greater, you have been invited to be a member, your mayor is already a member, although we, we do break that rule of thumb for smaller European cities and smaller US cities, which are generally a little bit um, smaller than 3 million. Um, and why we're significant is because in having an organization of 97 member cities, we basically represent 25% of global GDP and 700 million people worldwide. Um, and so when you think of this as a collective, it's quite a powerful group of people working together and sharing ideas on taking action on the climate emissions that are within the city's power. And this is quite important because in fact, cities are responsible for 70% of global, global energy emissions, and they are therefore essential to cutting emissions. They control building codes and land use and transport planning and they manage wastewater management. So the actions that cities take towards sustainable development can really drive powerful emission cuts and at the same time bring major economic jobs and social and health opportunities. And so national governments have committed to the Paris Accord and it's important that cities 
playing an active role can support the shift to sustainable outcomes um, and they are key to the success of the Paris Agreement. So what C40 has done is uh, define the essential role that cities can play in agreeing and achieving the high ambition of the Paris Agreement. Um, and we are very focused on uh, data-based action. So uh, our modeling team and with the assistance of ARAP, the consultancy, um, we have put together plans for cities to, uh, to keep within 1.5 degree warming and to achieve peak emissions by 2020. Um, and at the same time, these plans are, are focused on improving health and economic opportunity for our citizens because no mayor takes action on climate change merely because they are committed to climate change, although they often are. They do, they take actions because it's important to the citizens that vote for them as well. Um, so it's very important for mayors to learn about other things that mayors are doing that are good for health and economic opportunity. Um, and I think what's very important is that cities are already experiencing climate change on a day to day basis. It's not something that for them is a, a concept in the future. Uh, and here are four examples from C40 cities that happened in the past two or three years. There was the Mumbai monsoon, uh, the Cape Town drought in which they almost completely ran out of water, the California fires. And in fact, it's two years today since the Houston floods. So this is something that mayors want to know about and want to talk to other mayors about because they are not only incurring the costs of mitigation, they're also now incurring the cost of adaptation. And this is becoming more and more of a challenge for them. This is also becoming a political priority and we've seen the huge change uh, in public opinion that has led by the climate strikes also two years recently since, they, since Greta first did her climate strike. Um, and this is bleeding out into different uh, political opinions and, and as I'm talking about because it's becoming politically important for them to be seen to be taking action on climate. And these are the spaces that C40 steps up into. Um, and I think everyone who's based in the UK will be very, very familiar with the fact that we have an air, poly, um, an air, pollution, air pollution challenge. So we're in dire need of action and a dramatic shift on urban mobility in cities because in almost all uh, UK cities, um, air quality is in, in a very strong and, and distinct way linked to uh, transportation emissions. So the key thing about the power of global collaboration um, and our chair, Eric Garcetti, likes to say that we have a joke is that uh, good mayors borrow, great mayors steal. So C40 supports city leaders to help each other to deliver climate action and raise collective ambition. And here is a really nice example. You can see in the photo that's Mayor of London, Mayor Sadiq Khan. He is joined on the right hand side by the mayor of Paris, Anne Hidalgo, and the late mayor of Seoul, Park Won Soon. And they're launching uh, something called Evolution, which is a real world vehicle emissions tracker that is now available to citizens, citizens in Paris, London, and Seoul to name and shame the most polluting cars. And the interesting secret behind this was this was Sadiq Khan's idea. Mayor of Paris liked it so much, she asked if she could join in, and the mayor of Seoul did too. And, and so what became a real world vehicle emissions tracker just for citizens of London was then expanded through C40's links to Paris and Seoul as well. And this makes it all the more important and, and uh, market shifting. Um, so what to, what to look out for really in terms of climate action by mayors. So C40 and McKinsey research is, was really focused on answering that key strategic question. How do cities keep global temperatures under 1.5 degrees? If they're going to take action on, on the climate crisis, how can they strategically do so? Um, and I want to bring the focus of, of this conversation to mobility. Um, so the, uh, the answers to the question about where, what do the cities need to do on transport um, came through from this research. And it's that 30% of overall emissions in global cities is for tra 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 transport. And in fact, if they invest in transit oriented development, which means reducing um, the amount of vehicles, vehicle miles traveled that are being carried out and also um, redesigning um, urban planning so that more people can have access to more transport we can reduce those emissions by five to 15%. Um, investing in shifts to mass transit, walking and cycling can, can reduce those emissions by five to 15% as well, in addition to the transit oriented, oriented development and investment and enabling next generation mobility, which is a McKinsey word for shared connected EV AVs, has the potential to reduce it by 10 to 25%. And finally, interventions to commercial freight. So efficiency in logistics and vehicle regulation could reduce 5% of those emissions. And it was that research in mind that we then tailored something called the Green and Healthy Streets Declaration, which I'm going to talk to you about a little bit more today. So this was a political declaration that we launched in 2017, and it's been signed now by 35 global cities. And the headline commitment and the actions in it is to firstly, with our partners, 
only zero emission buses from 2025. So from 2025, the signatory cities will only buy electric buses um, for their city fleets. Um, they will not be renewing any buses that are not electric. So they won't be adding fossil fuel buses to their fleets from 2025. And some cities have already started buying electric buses, but the intention is from 2025, no further fossil fuel powered buses will be bought. And the second is to ensure a major area of the city is zero emission by 2030. So this, you will see a significant a section of the city is defined and all trips within that will be by mass transit, walking and cycling, um, or if they are by vehicle, will be by a zero emission vehicle. And uh, why do mayors do this? Why, why do mayors make these quite bold and, and frankly quite hard commitments? And the reason is because when you implement um, a broad scale complex direct declaration like this and seek to increase walking and cycling to improve public transport, to reduce access to fossil fuel vehicles and regulate them out of use in a certain area, to electrify vehicles and to increase green spaces and coverage, it has follow on benefits for citizens. Um, it means that the increase in active mobility has follow on health benefits and we see um, uh, a decrease in health um, impacts um, and more resilience towards poor air quality. We see reduced noise, uh, we see reduced urban, the urban heat island effect and anyone who was in the UK last year, sorry last week, will have noticed that the urban heat, that the, the urban heat island effect was pretty significant in the urban areas and improves urban flood resistance. We see an increase in retail activity, we see reduced deaths and disease, we see reduced healthcare costs for society, we see increased neighbourhood attractiveness and more livable cities. So they do this because it is good for the climate, but they also do this because it is good for citizens. Um, so I think, I think what most people will be interested in hearing about is so what exactly are these C40 cities doing? And I will lead with London because I realise a lot of the listeners are in the UK and will be more familiar with the London case, but I'll give you a few other ones as well because, as I said, we are 97 global megacities, so we work with, with cities all over the world. So London is considered a leader in, in the establishment of low emission zones. Uh, this is a little bit of an old slide, so it's no longer a 2020 proposal. Uh, we know that the uh, ULES has gone ahead and the 2021 proposal with the expansion of the, of the ULES is going ahead. They are implementing those cameras as we speak. But what London is doing is gradually tightening their urban vehicle access restrictions to send a strong signal to the market and to drivers for cleaner vehicles. So they are increasing the um, charges to vehicles uh, that are dirtier. So they have the highest standard in the world for a Euro 6 within the ULES, Euro 6 diesel and a Euro 3 petrol. Um, and the reason why they are able to do this is because they use a charge rather than a ban. Um, so that charge is a strong disincentive to use a Euro 6 diesel. And over the medium term, they're expecting people to convert their vehicles. Um, but I think it's also important, while there is this hard stick in the ULAs, to consider that at the moment, EVs are exempt from the congestion charge and exempt, of course, from the ULAs. So there is a carrot on the other end saying, please move away from dirty vehicles. And at the moment, if you use an EV, it is completely free to drive. Um, and this is a very clear and straightforward way that they're moving towards establishing a completely zero emission zone in London by 2030. The Corporation of London um, are the borough that is most uh, leading in the way they, they collaborate with the Mayor of London and they announced as part of their COVID response that they were seeking to implement the first zero emission zone in London by 2024. So within this sort of ULES um, boundary, um, you will see a smaller area that will be completely zero emission in the earliest four years from now. And the intention is to, is to join up this work with different boroughs and expand that area. Um, so there's the example from London. The second example is Milan, a very good friend of Mayor Khan is Mayor Sala. So Milan followed London and the congestion charge, uh, the area Chi in 2003, no, 2009. And as of last year, they implemented area B. So this is actually Europe's largest low emission zone. And area B has the standard for diesel vehicles at Euro 4. Uh, different to the Mayor of London, Mayor Sala has the power to ban vehicles. The Mayor of London actually doesn't have the power to ban a vehicle, which is why they use a charge. Uh, in, in Milan to drive a diesel that is a standard Euro um, 3 to a 1 will incur you a fine of 80 euros. Um, and the area Chi, Milan's existing congestion charge zone, has a diesel standard of Euro 6. Um, Mayor Sala, like the Mayor of London, is uh, very strong on diesel because that is uh, causing the most significant air quality um, damage. Um, so similar to London as well, there is a very strong negative press on the use of diesel vehicles and some quite severe restrictions on that. 
and at the same time driving an EV in these areas is for free. So you can see a stick to move away from dirtier vehicles and the carrot to move towards clean vehicles. Um, and both London and Milan are publishing restrictions and they're followed by Paris as well, where they graduate this movement towards ultimately an area which is only zero emission vehicles. Barcelona is coming in soon as well. They have also established a low emission zone as of this year with a similar standard to Milan. So that's a Euro 4 diesel and a Euro 3 petrol. Um, of course, Barcelona is very famous for the super blocks where they're also just gradually reducing the amount of traffic operating in the area by implementing um, urban design interventions that reduce the access of lots of different vehicles. Um, and Madrid is quite an interesting, different example because they don't use the, quite the, they don't use the same design as, as their peers. Um, they restrict through traffic through Madrid Central, but they provide free on-street parking to EVs and two hours parking for eco vehicles. And that's them again creating these sort of graduated incentives to move away from dirty vehicles and, and towards cleaner ones. Um, and they're already seeing significant benefits from this, even as there are some shifts in, 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 the, in the political commitment and political definition of what they're trying to achieve. Um, just across the pond, because I think it's of interest, US cities are talking more and more seriously about congestion pricing. They are very much inspired by the London design. Um, so the idea is to use congestion pricing to incentivize cleaner vehicles. And so you can see an example of New York, uh, that of Seattle, that of uh, Los Angeles, um, San Francisco and Vancouver, uh, and really recently Philadelphia as well. So congestion charging as an emissions-based regulation tool is becoming more and more popular and we're gonna see more examples of it. Um, so what are we trying to achieve with local zero emission areas? What, what can you expect to see emerging? Um, well, so the first aim is a significant impact on emissions within the zone. So a small number of carefully chosen zones with strict standards that largely result in a traffic reduction within the zones. We're looking for a zone where there's traffic calming, less vehicles overall, more walking, cycling and public transit, and any vehicles that do enter are zero emission. We're also looking as a result of this, this one area where this is designed as a cumulative impact on emissions across the city. So we either regulate them, we either make a slightly larger zone or we have a number of different ones. We have a large number of zones with relaxed standards that ensure a large number of zones can be implemented and people see in the medium term where the ship is sailing. Um, and ultimately the idea is to build towards a larger zero emission zone across the city and accelerate the development and uptake of zero emission solutions by providing this strong incentive in certain high trip areas. So what are the cities that, what are the challenges that cities have? Um, the first challenge is a clear definition of what constitutes a zero emission area. It's quite a complicated concept to put across. Um, it's very involved and it's quite important to make sure that every different stakeholder understands how they're going to be affected. Um, so it's quite important for cities to put across the vehicle type and the qualifying technology. What is a zero emission vehicle? Will this be allowed? When will this happen? And what will be required in the short term? And the link to that is, is what sort of support is available from government to make this shift and who could qualify for that and, and will it help? They're also looking for medium term options for mass transit and shared mobility to complement long term infrastructure investment because there is this need for significant shift to shared mobility and mass transit. They need rapid investment in and the scale up of EV charging infrastructure. And there is a little bit of a tension in the question about to what extent cities should be investing in rolling out EV charging infrastructure and to what extent they should be making the way for the private sector to do that. To do that. And they are knotting about this, this complicated problem. Um, they need to find solutions to accommodate delivery and servicing. It's, it's not very straightforward. Um, while it's straightforward to move commuters around and, and incentivize them to shift, um, freight delivery and servicing needs to happen in almost all areas. And so to finding ways to make sure that happens while we have these urban transformation. And then holistic interventions, which also target non-transport emissions and wider livable streets outcomes. So for example, zero emission buildings and collaborating with that. So what in particular about freight operation, operations, because this is the, the gnarliest problem of them all. Um, a really good cities to look to, for example, is Oslo, where 60% of new car sales are electric and plug-in hybrid. But I should emphasize that in, in uh, Norway, there is a tax on all cars and uh, there is a zero rated tax on, on EVs, which brings the cost of an EV into parity in 2020 with the cost of a fossil fuel vehicle, which is the reason why there has been such a significant uptake of EVs. Um, but in addition to that, they do have incentives to use EVs. So they have free passage for EVs for their toll gates. Um, they have financial subsidy to small van owners. They have access to the bus and taxi parking lanes for EVs and dedicated parking for electric vans. 
they have subsidies for home charging and they work with the private sector in quite a lot of detail to roll out charging in commercial garages, new construction at curbside. Um, so this is, this is a country in the city that's very, very committed to rolling out EVs in order to complement their, their, their ambitions for zero emission mobility. A second really nice example, and if you are in the freight sector, it would be well worth looking at this, is Amsterdam. <clears throat> they have a target of a zero emission city in logistics by 2025, and they have done a lot of stakeholder engagement uh, with public and private partners uh, in order to ensure that this is a reasonable and achievable um, aim. So it's not as if it's just been a public uh, or, or political announcement. They have in fact spoken to the stakeholders to make sure that this, this is achievable. Um, so well worth looking at if you are interested is the zero emission freight roadmap for, um, for Rotterdam. Um, they are also leading in their procurement. So they have a systemic introduction of zero emission vehicles in their municipal um, fleet and a zero emission delivery requirement for public procurement, which means if you are doing delivery for the city, it must be in a zero emission vehicle. I have significant pilot projects and a consolidation pilot project with DHL, and they're working with the industry to inform the upcoming zero emission area, and they have a pilot that started last year. So city challenges in particular on zero emission freight are understanding operated business models and needs. Um, this is an, an area of mobility where city has very little control and thus very little insight. So they need to do extensive stakeholder engagement in order to understand how the policies they're proposing will influence and impact on businesses. Um, and effectively, this is to help cities to design these better. They need a lot of data and information in order to bring the industry along with their ambitious but mostly realistic policies. There is a significant need for zero emission vehicle availability, and there, there is a need to signal to the OEM market to ensure the right vehicles are in the pipeline. There is a general consensus that smaller vans are certainly there as far as the market's concerned, but medium to heavy duty trucks are not yet available. Um, and this might present a challenge implementing zero emission areas in the medium term. There's a question about charging infrastructure, where, when, who will pay for it and how, and how do we make this happen? Um, there is a question about doing good stakeholder support and collaboration. So facilitating industry transition in particular when the industry is quite diverse. We've got some smaller operators um, who would find it more difficult to, to, to change and they might be disadvantaged uh, as compared to the larger operators. And then clear timelines on timing and scaling. So not moving the goalposts unnecessarily. Um, and we, I think we've probably seen some examples of that this, this year in, in terms of the clean air zones in UK cities. Um, it would be nice if uh, government could just slow down a little bit in, in changing the plans because people are making uh, fleet procurement decisions on a five to 10 year timeline. So these are some things that cities, when they work together in our networks, talk to each other about and compare notes on, uh, coach each other and give each other tips and tricks. So what can you do to support a C40 mayor or, or a mayor that is uh, demonstrating policies that are very similar to these kinds that I'm talking about right now? Uh, the first is to recognize this policy direction. Uh, every investment decision made now needs to consider how would this protect my business in a zero emission future and how can we part of, be part of the solution and not the problem? How do we help to demonstrate that urban mobility vision is already here? So give mayors examples of this alternative vision for the urban mobility uh, and seize that first mover advantage. They're very keen to have demonstrations that what their vision is is working and makes business sense. Uh, they're looking for partners like that. Um, and collaborate to find solutions. So where there are gaps and where collaboration is needed and information sharing would help, please do collaborate with policymakers and where pol possible and where it makes business sense with other providers. Um, because this is a significant way to move us forward. We all have the same planet um, and this vision will be beneficial for voters. So we should make sure it's beneficial for business as well. So this is how I can be contacted if you'd like to follow up with me after this, if I'm not able to answer all your questions. Um, and what I think I'll do now, I'll leave this up for a little bit longer and see if I can see the chat box. Um, but let me hand back over to, to David for some of the questions. We can take some questions now. People want to um, come in and, and ask questions. We're open on the text box. is now open. I'll start in a, in a kind of, with a couple of questions from myself. Uh, bear in mind some of the things you've said there, noting the cities you've got uh, there. I'm just consider asking the question, really, how do you engage with new city mayors? So, you, you, for example, I'm thinking of cities I've been to that aren't on the list, for example, Kiev and Moscow. How would you meet and interstate contact with mayors of these cities to actually start getting engagement there? I mean, the Arch is a global organisation, so I'd love to think there are people with contacts. 
Yes, and this is an excellent question and quite a good one. In fact, a lot of people ask me, is my mayor a member of C40? And, and if not, can they become one? Um, so the good news, David, is that Moscow is in fact a member of C40 cities, but Kiev is not. Um, we have a city diplomacy team whose role it is to uh, reach out to different mayors um, and make connection and invite them to join C40. Um, we were established over 10 years ago, and that, that was the time when we, we, we sort of built the membership up. So I, I don't believe that we're inviting a lot of new members at the moment, except for a recent push to increase the, the Chinese city membership. Um, so we now have 11 cities in China who have joined. Um, but technically what happens um, is the mayor is extended an invitation from the chair. So our current chair is the mayor of Los Angeles, um, Eric Garcetti. Uh, he will formally uh, send an invitation to the mayor of that city, um, outline what C40 is about, um, outline the benefits of membership, and also outline the expectations of membership. So currently our members, a requirement of membership is that they produce a climate action plan um, by the end of this year that is in line with the Paris Agreement. We have some resources to help cities to do so, but ultimately we also sign off that their climate action plan is within is in line with the Paris Agreement. Um, we also have participation standards, so we expect uh, cities to participate in webinars, um, to sign up to ambitious agreements and deliver on them. And when they don't, it, it is also incumbent on, upon our diplomacy team to um, have a disciplinary conversation is the best way to describe it. And we have invited cities to leave the organization as a result. So uh, I think that answers your question. Okay. The second one I'd like to throw in is the use of rail. You did touch on obviously different types of transport, integrated transport, and obviously places like the UK, we have the challenge that we have disused lines from the old industrial revolution are sitting there. Um, can these lines be used obviously for to, to actually be reinstated as tram lines to reduce um, use of cars? Could, could they be used for freight and light freight? And can they actually become part of the distribution network? I know these shopping centres like Stratford, but also Amsterdam and places like Cologne, where you actually have big shopping centres actually in the railway station. So rather than the out of town shopping centres around the M25 that we have in, in the UK, almost saying, you know what, well, let's go back to the high street and start to actually build around the um, state, build around stations and infrastructure. What are your thoughts on that, that type of thinking? So we, we are fairly technology agnostic um, about how a city reduce, well, let me put it to, let me answer this question in a slightly different way. What we do is we engage with cities to achieve a, a, dual, a dual approach to reducing carbon emissions from transport in their city. And ultimately that's reduced, that's done in the following ways. Reducing overall vehicle miles traveled, which means shifting people to mass transit, walking and cycling, and then trying to shift all vehicle trips that have to happen to zero emission vehicle, um, zero emission technology. So um, we're big fans of large scale mass transit infrastructure inter interventions and also repurposing um, railway, for example, infrastructure, if, if that makes sense and is, is affordable to, to, to carry out new, um, new roles. And it, we, we don't, we're not very prescriptive with cities uh, about how they achieve the sort of twin goals of, of reducing emissions. They know their cities, they, they have excellent competent people. We provide guidance and we link them with their peers to get ideas um, and, and steal things effectively. So um, if it works, if it'll reduce climate emissions um, and if, it, if it's excellent for the city, uh, then that's brilliant. And something in particular you talked about having um, out of town shopping centers. Um, we have a whole team that engages with cities on, on urban planning and urban design and uh, something that was a, a big takeaway from, from uh, a, a task force that was formed on, on COVID-19 response was a, a rethink about what we call 15 minute cities. So the idea of designing cities so that everything that you need in terms of services, in terms of education, in terms of jobs, in terms of shopping is within a 15 minute walk roll of where, of where you live right now. So I think that responds in certain ways. There's a lot of discussions among different experts about what is the best way to design a city? How do we incentivize um, reducing climate emissions while also regenerating the economy? Um, and how does urban design play a role in doing that? Which is not really an answer to your question, but an indication that it is an interesting topic. Interesting, I like the 15 minute bit. Uh, I'd like to see that imposed in Moscow, having been stuck in traffic jams half the day. Those who have been there understand the humor in that. I've got some further questions here from um, Hemda, who's up in, up in Hendon. 
I'd like, I like the name and shame principle. How much contact is there with car manufacturers? Can you turn your thing on again, Kate? Apologies, I, I got rid of my screen and then panicked. Um, so the question is a really good one. So how much contact there is with car manufacturers? We tend to move, we don't tend to speak on behalf of the mayors that we represent, but we can occasionally facilitate good conversations um, with the industry um, in order to incentivize uh, better decisions about uh, what, 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 what models they're bringing online. Um, so something like the Green and Health, Healthy Streets Declaration, where 35 mayors have signed something and they all agree that what we're trying to do is create a significant area of the city as their emission, is a very powerful signal to the automotive manufacturing market that we need to have zero emission alternatives coming online. And mayors are very aware that there has been slow um, delivery of these kinds of models to market. In fact, a, a common complaint they hear from the freight industry and the bus industry and, and, and sometimes private citizens is that it's quite difficult to get a zero emission alternative. Um, so there has been a call, for example, from our cities to facilitate a, a summit, a taxi summit effectively, to try and talk about how to get more and more zero emission taxi models online so that mayors can be stronger on their regulation of taxis, which are very significant travelers and, and create huge amounts of um, trips and the, therefore emissions in cities to make sure that that is something um, that they can reliably do. Um, so we tend not to speak directly to the automotive manufacturing industry because we engage with mayors, but we work with, for example, the climate group um, and EV100 groups, and we are tuned in with them and, and their business information um, and they effectively lobby the industry to understand what we can push mayors to do in order to signal to the market. So we create an ecosystem of allies and friends, um, but C40 doesn't always, in fact, very seldom talks directly to the automotive manufacturing market. Um, and in some cases, we have mayors who are very, very cross with the automotive manufacturing market. Um, and so won't be seen on the same panel with them and won't speak with them. Um, so for example, Quite famously, there is the Volkswagen Dieselgate, where Volkswagen attempted to sidestep some regulations. Uh, that has caused political upset among a lot of different people. Um, and so we have to manage that as well. Okay, thank you. Next one, I say some people, please put your questions in the Q&A bit, not in the Zoom webinar bit. So I'm picking up questions from both, which makes it not easy for me. Um, one question, here, is there any city in the world that you're not, in you're not involved with, you'd like to be involved with? Um, I can't answer that because I'm not on the, the, the diplomacy team. Um, and I, I can probably fairly comfortably say that if, if, if the, it's a large mega city above 3 million people, we have a relationship with them. Some of our cities are more active than others, and it does wane, wax and wane as, as we have different political leadership. So uh, the city's membership remains, even if the mayor changes. And when a mayor um, is voted out of office or steps down for some or other reason, we do have to re-engage diplomatically, identify the priorities of the new mayor, and, and make sure that we are aligning and, and, and in tune with them. And as you can imagine, often there are, there are diffs, uh, shifts from different political parties. So yes, I think we have, we have all the mayors, all the cities that we need, but our relationships wax and wane, and we have to constantly um, make sure that we, we are, we are strengthen, strengthen, strengthening them again all the time. I think the best way to describe the kind of lobbying we do is that we are kind of a nurturing parent where someone other than sort of like Greenpeace or someone that would be, would be a, a little bit more um, antagonistic and, 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 and more strong. We, we, we like to be in the room and to be friends um, rather than outside the room and shouting. Next one I've got for you, and you may have kind of um, covered this part of this off. Um, there was extensive coverage of electric vehicles. Um, have, in terms of your work, how much has gone into things like thoughts behind power so alternative power sources, like hydrogen and fuel cell technology? So I should emphasize, actually, I did talk quite a lot about electric vehicles, but we are also technology agnostic about the, the source of the zero emission vehicles. Um, so the reason why I think I've emphasized electric vehicles is at present, electric vehicle technology seems to, to be the most efficient for cities, whereas hydrogen fuel cells are more efficient for longer distances. Um, so, I mean, if, if hydrogen fuel cells suddenly became a much better option, uh, there's no reason why that wouldn't be permitted uh, in a zero emission vehicle, so it's a zero emission area. Um, and you will see that kind of thing in city regulations. So what I should have really said was zero emission rather than electric. Um, 
because I, I think that would be more in line with the fact that we are broad minded. Um, but in reality, electric vehicles seem to be the most um, seem to be the current winners in an urban context. Okay. Next question I've got is um, whether this this goes into your um, remit. It's about sustainability in circular economy and waste management. Do you have any thoughts or any 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 policy stances on waste management uh, systems within sustainable cities? So there is a whole section of C40 cities that engages on waste management. We have a separate declaration on waste management, um, which I would invite anyone interested in that to to explore. It's on our website. Um, and I mean, the only area where we would focus on waste management is a, a significant question among cities about the disposal of electric um, vehicle batteries. Um, some people feel, seem to feel like this is some sort of barrier to adopting it, but we, we also struggle to dispose of used cars. Um, but the cities are very concerned with the idea that, uh, you know, bringing a whole lot of electric vehicles into the fleet without having a very clear sense of how we dispose of electric batteries um, and how do we, you know, ensure that this, the, 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 this is a zero impact um, investment is is quite a it's, a it's a conversation that we have regularly another question kind of building up on obviously these are from our membership but we're getting cro a total cross section of questions uh, so one question here is about the wider question of the cost of removing dirty vehicles and going electric this was from paul but the emphasis on greater need for cleaner fuel types and how we are looking again at nuclear generation we've supplied the power needed for a transition to zero emissions vehicles. So it's about this, how do you generate electricity in the first place and what are the environmental concerns around that? Paul, if I, if I interpret your question wrong, I apologise. So are you, Kate? I do pose it again, Paul. But I think the question you're asking is, is it worth moving to cleaner vehicles if the power that, gener that powers these, the power in the, in the upstream um, that powers these vehicles is dirty in and of itself? Um, I don't have the exact statistics. But the reason why we are still pushing for zero emission vehicles is because it is still cleaner for an electric car driven on entirely coal-fired um, coal electricity um, in terms of GHG emissions than for a fossil fueled vehicle. It's not brilliant, but it's still cleaner. Um, but we do work with cities to think about what their, their upstream um, energy um, supply is as well. And we have a separate, a separate section who are working with cities because they are significant procurers of energy. Um, and a number have made a commitment to buying only renewable energy. Um, and in cities, for example, like in South Africa, where there is one um, electricity provider for the entire country and it is government owned, it's quite a significant signal from local government to national government that they need to rethink the way that they are powering and making decisions about um, energy procurement. Um, so it's, it's, it's used as a political tool mainly to signal, but that procurement power, because they buy from the grid and then on sell to customers, is, is a really powerful thing to use. You use um, work, you use work say, if you'd like to email me, I will find the statistics about the fact that an electric vehicle that is coal, fire, um, coal, coal powered is still cleaner than a fossil fuel vehicle. There we go. Um, I want to throw one in here that we mentioned politics here. And there's, all, there's always one question, Helen, who mentioned inferring on the Trumpisms about negative, how, how do we actually deal with the negative administration from the USA, for example, pres president is in denial about global warming. How do we tackle something as powerful as this? The, the fact you mentioned that your mayor, your lead is a mayor of LA, which is the, not, not last year, the US city. So I take it part of your strategy is gonna be around, you can't pick off the, 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 the so-called person that might only have 40% of the electorate. You look at picking off where the influence can have lo more locally, although LA is not a, it's a mega city, isn't it? <laughs> Any thoughts on that without getting too po political? Uh, Irish doesn't have a big presence in the USA, funny enough, so we can duck no. out of this one. No, I won't duck out of this one at all. This is one of my favourite questions. Um, so the answer is, you after the election, you get up, you dust yourself off, and you realign the battleship. Um, what's really interesting about having a chair who is the mayor of Los Angeles is that he is, in fact, a political leader of three million people in the US, which is a larger constituency than quite a lot of US senators. Um, and there are two things that happen. Um, first was when President Trump announced that he was pulling out of the Paris Agreement, uh, he said, I'm, I'm the mayor of Pittsburgh, uh, sorry, I'm, I'm, I, I represent the people of Pittsburgh, not Paris. And the mayor of Pittsburgh called up the mayor of Paris and said, would you like to share a platform while we tell the world that we're still in? And these two mayors led a, a public demonstration that was basically called We're Still In, that says, even though President Trump has pulled out of the Paris Agreement, 
mayors, particularly C40 city mayors, are still in and will abide by their with the, the, the Paris Agreement within the emissions that they are that they are in charge of. And the mayor of Pittsburgh is in charge of quite a lot of emissions and can still take action to reduce emissions within his remit. Um, the mayor of Los Angeles um, is basically using the C40 platform uh, and the, the, the cl climate diplomacy that comes along with that to build a coalition um, against the actions that President Trump is taking um, uh, uh, to not take action on climate. Um, so he is the founder of Climate Mayors, which is a, a group of US mayors who uh, talk to, talk about, promote taking climate action within where they are powerful. Um, so they use their public stage to, to, to provide an alternative narrative um, and they use the powers that are available to them to still take, take action despite that. So in US, US politics, you don't have to agree with the president. In fact, it gets you quite a lot of press if you don't. Uh, so that's, that's how we run climate diplomacy when the leader of a, a significant emitter in the world uh, doesn't agree with what we think. Uh, we let people know. Change the subject slightly, which is also about, about the environment. Again, everything's got an environmental connection, obviously, about electric vehicles requiring batteries and of course the scarce metal requirements you know um for an important how from an important environmental point of use can this lack of these metals be overcome and the results of pollution for extraction be factored in and overcome so this is about actually the you having to create you know to, to create the well the battery technology we need the rare metals therefore there is the mining and the environmental damage to that so I have to say, I'm not really a, a deep expert in electric vehicles. I'm mainly, as you probably can hear, a political campaigner um, that sets up a vision for where things need to be um, and hope that I have a, a great team behind me who can answer these types of questions. Um, but what I can say is that if at the end of 2030, we have replaced every single vehicle on the road that's fossil fuel with just another zero emission vehicle, we haven't really done our job properly. What we're also trying to do is reduce overall vehicles on the road to provide alternative kinds of trips. And we do this through designing 15 minute cities, creating more public transport options, taking more walking and cycling. Um, even freight can be delivered in much more efficient ways through consolidation, coordination, and even cargo bike deliveries if, it, if it's appropriate. Um, so while there are definitely gremlins in some of the alternatives people are providing, it's better to have a world in 2030 to have gremlins in than it is to continue. Um, and fossil fuel vehicles are certainly not without their own problems as well. So I'm unwilling to throw the baby out with the bathwater while still accepting that there are some challenges and there are some handbrakes to the delivery of what we need. Um, so that's why we have multiple different strategies to achieving what we need to do. The next one actually is a very broad question about, the question has been how has the COVID-19 pandemic affected the focus of potential for new cities to join? I actually broaden that question is how is, how is the changes or what research would we be interested in doing in changes of transport patterns due to COVID-19? So I think that the, the, it's, it's about not, COVID-19 isn't just about how you grow as a group, but how do you reflect on maybe different, in countries like the UK where we haven't relied upon um, uh, community resilience like Sweden, where people are just carrying on normally, so really, how, how does this go into your agenda? What are your, what are your thoughts at this stage on this? So this is an interesting question. Um, I think the first thing to say is that COVID-19 has highlighted how ill-prepared we are for a global catastrophe. And in particular, it's highlighted that there are some, the significant inequalities in society mean that when a global catastrophe happens, it happens so much worse to the poorest and more vulnerable of us than it does to everyone else. And this is, I mean, quite a helpful illustration of why climate change is such a dramatic challenge for us to overcome. And it's much more significant than COVID-19 because it is so much more significant for the poor and most vulnerable. So it's like a test run. Um, and those within C40 cities, and, and I really invite anyone who's interested to see, we have a, a mayor's task force who literally came together and met every second week via webinar. We had a huge webinar with all these sort of different mayor's faces on them listening to each other about what, what we need to do to respond to COVID. So they were literally swapping tips on, on how you sanitize buses and, and rolling out temporary cycling, cycling lanes to also having a conversation about what does the recovery from COVID-19 need to look like? Um, and this is interesting because it has shifted the way that people move. It has meant this huge recession. So while on the one hand, the green movement are asking for a lot of 
injections of financing and huge stimulus to green solutions. On the other hand, we have a lot less money and an expectation of a lot less money in the system to invest in this going forward. Um, and this is going to place a burden on businesses. This means the poorest are going to find it more difficult to recover. Um, and it means that the world we're going to be looking at experiencing in this two or three years is, is going to be quite, quite different. And the message that came out of the mayor's meeting was that we need new models and we need a green and just recovery. And this has been the thing that has sort of shaped their vision. Um, so to bring it maybe back down to mobility in particular, the investment in zero emission vehicles in particular has led to a question mark. We've seen a huge drop in automotive sales um, because people have less money in order to invest in that. Um, and there's been a call from C40 mayors to, in, to if for any stimulus to be a green stimulus. And in particular, if we're going to look at things like subsidies for jobs and subsidies for, for to the automotive manufacturer, it needs to have um, expectations that that will go towards greener solutions like electric vehicles. And I think you saw may, may have seen that the stimulus package from Paris was was a world leader in, in what they expected to be done with the money that was given to, to, to their industries. Um, the second thing, and I think maybe everyone on this call has had an experience of this, is lockdown prevent and the re dramatic reduction in traffic presented an opportunity for something that normally cities would have to do extensive consultation and shift traffic out of the way in order to achieve, which is these temporary cy cycling lanes. And people who wouldn't normally have been cyclists and who normally travel quite far for their jobs, but now are moving more in their, their environments, got to experience a lot more active mobility. Um, and it's much easier to consult on things like a temporary cycling lane when someone has tried it out rather than ask them if they think it would be a good idea in a conceptual way. Um, and so almost all European C40 cities and quite a lot of US cities and South, um, South American cities have rolled out these temporary cycling lanes or traffic calming activities and are looking now to make them permanent. Um, and this wouldn't have been possible if we hadn't had the dramatic traffic um, reduction. And the third thing that has been very interesting was the air quality improvements because we have removed traffic from the roads. Um, so NO2 basically has, has significantly improved. And this has provided real world data for cities to use to justify traffic reduction in the future. So again, if you model it, it's a little bit less robust to challenge, but if you have actual real world data, um, this is much stronger. And you can say this is the level of um, air quality improvement we can see if we reduce traffic by this much. Um, I mean, I'm definitely not advocating that we need to stop the whole global economy to save the climate. That's, that's not what we're looking for right now. But what we did gain was some interesting perspectives, some opportunities for new thinking, and some real world data that we wouldn't otherwise have gained um, in this kind of interesting experiment. Um, so cities are going to use that to try and cultivate um, arguments for better air quality re regulation in traffic, uh, stronger arguments for why walking and cycling measures are really, really important and hopefully advocate for um, subsidies and support for, for business and industry to move towards zero emission vehicle alternatives as they put in place zero emission areas um, a decade from now. Okay, another very, hopefully a quick question um, from uh, Quasi, I'm not sure what country you're in, but your question infers you might not be in the UK. I'm interested to know about commitments made for cities from Pakistan, India and Bangladesh, so basically the Indian subcontinent area. Any, what sort of, are there cities there you've been involved with or engaging with? So we do have a number of Indian cities that are, an, um, an, that are members of C40 cities. The reason why these cities haven't tended to sign the Green and Healthy Streets Declaration is actually much more of a governance um, uh, challenge rather than anything else. And that's because local government in Indian cities have very, very little power over streets and over procurement of buses. And a lot of that is held at the state government. And the state government, while we engage as C40, we are a mayoral organization. So it's quite difficult to nav navigate where power and uh, budget sits and, and where political um, governance sits. But that's not to say Indian cities don't benefit from hearing what other cities are achieving through the Green and Healthy Streets Declaration. They're just not able to sign it hand on heart and say they can deliver a zero emission area. Um, that said, Indian cities are leading on the procurement of electric buses um, and on the building of electric buses. So Chennai is a really nice example um, uh, where they have a, made significant fleet commitments. Um, and I, I work quite closely with them, so I think they're a great city. Okay, another question from Hemna, just a comment. It's the use of a life cycle analysis for all products and processes. That's a centre of all technology where you cost in all parts, including disposal and health effects. So you're talking about, yes, yeah, so if you, I, I'm trying to think and infer that the whole manufacturing to disposal for, for, for how it affects the environment and people. So it's how do we get that science working closer together? 
This is a really interesting area for C40 mayors. They're very interested in the circular economy uh, and making sure there's an understanding that if they put energy and, and investment behind something, that it ultimately will have a zero net effect. Um, so definitely look on our website. We have a circular economy team who, who engage with mayors by, uh, around this. Um, and we also have some recent thinking about the, the donut economics. So this is new thinking by Kate Raworth um, about how we can build a thriving city uh, rather than, than just a, a growing city. Um, so, so if you're interested in this area, this is, this is an area which is politically very interesting to C40 mayors. Um, no, no, knowing Hemda's background, being academia and university, uh, obviously, I, do you have contacts with universities to, to try to um, promote and work with and for, for commissioning research? Are there routes for closer collaboration? There could be. It's well worth sending me an email to find out. We often work with different universities and I could probably connect you with someone within C40 who, in the particular area that you're interested in, who would know more and could tell you more. Okay. Um, next one is, somebody's asked if, is Dubai a member of C40 cities? Yeah, there we go. Dubai is, yes. I'm just trying to get these questions on because I'll ask no more questions to be asked. We've got 15 open and seven minutes to go. <laughs> and I do want to stick to time. Um, Parisa asked a question or makes a statement, the environment doesn't have borders if all cities do not join to the zero emissions plan. Can you think if some cities implement the zero, if, sorry, do you think if some cities implement the zero emission can affect on climate change? I think trying to, I think you've kind of answered this broad question that this is mayors working together. So if there's a, if there's a number of cities in the region and one isn't taking part, then there will be political at mayoral level to have that discussion and try and get people voluntarily on on good is that fair yeah, comment that's how it works i'm trying to get the questions out i do apologize for those asked all the time uh, how far do you, do you think the impact from the public in sustaining this or what percentage of the role the public comes in is to achieve the target so Rick, what is the your have you been mayoral focus how do you engage with the public and what are your relationships with the public like well, this is the key complaint from, from some of our cities to us when we push them for ambition. They often look for political cover. Um, so they find it by demonstrating that other mayors think and doing the same thing. So when Sadiq Khan wants to do something and Mayor Hidalgo and the Mayor of Seoul want to do it as well, people see that actually other mayors think this is a good idea. And secondly, they learn from each other on how they build political support within their constituencies and they feel braver and thus take uh, more ambitious action. Um, I think that answers it quite quickly. Yep. Next one from Dara. Um, the question was, are there any challenges with developing economies? I will change the question. What is the main challenge for developing economies? The main challenge is that we, the majority of emissions in the world happens in the global north, and that's where the majority of action needs to be taken. Um, but the Paris Agreement, everyone signed up to taking action on, and there's not enough money and support and skills to help developing countries in the south. So what we do at C40 is try and lend skills from the global north to the global south, lending ideas, lending solutions. But we put a lot of pressure on global north to really act hard because their global north, north uh, global south partners really need them to do that because it's unfair to ask them to, to make changes if their global north mayors aren't making the same level, if not more. Thank you. Uh, Neil from the Highlands of Scotland, do you foresee more people moving out of cities, perhaps to es escape climate change restrictions or viruses? And what is the knock-on effect to rural economies? That's, that, 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 that's, a, that's a seminar on its own right, I realise that, but can you give a one-line answer to that one? Do you foresee more people moving out of cities? That's the question. I do, but I see a lot more people moving to cities. We expect by 2050 that more than 60% of the world's population will be living in cities, and that'll be very poor people as well. So in fact, this problem will, will compound itself even further as we uh, urbanise a little bit more. And that's the key question, Neil. It's not about the UK's perception. I, I, I had someone commenting who's not from the UK at work saying, but we are very English centric or Scottish centric or British centric. I'll, I'll let you choose the noun that describes yourself first, or South African centric or wherever. It is the thing is that globally, people, you know, we do not see things globally. You know, pe people's international travel tends to be France, the States, and Spain. We tend to ourselves see broader cities. So I think that's a part of a challenge. Does is C40 cities uh, promoting tree planting in major cities to reduce? carbon emissions? Yes, we have a whole network called the Cooling Cities Network. And a really nice example is the city of Medellin who in Colombia, who recently won an Ashton Award. They have planted um, a number of cycling corridors with trees, and this is estimated to cool the city by two degrees. So it's a really big focus of ours as part of our adaptation work, and cities really like it. The mayor of LA is another big fan of this, that they have the 
a very poor level of green cover in their city and they're set to be extremely hot and people don't take public transport for there are no trees to stand in to wait for the bus. Your presentation mentioned port cities. You mentioned Amsterdam and, Rot and Rotterdam. I've been to Amsterdam, but not to Rotterdam. Is there any influence that city mayors can bring to bear on visiting shipping with the emissions and environmental damage they may cause? I I'm particularly interested in Rotterdam because I did note that Rotterdam has got the Europort. So unlike in the UK where you've got we have got rail transport hubs like at Durft, I think Junction 19 of the M1, in, in, right in the middle of England, um, and then it's road travel out, but I think, I think it's a railway line near, or I think it's a line, line near it. Whereas you've got the ports in Rotterdam, you have that distribution, the shipping's arrived and the market is really next to it. So, but, but shipping fuel, of course, causes pollution as well. And this is a really nice question because it's been a recent focus of C40 as a result of the influence of the chair. So this is Mayor Eric Gossetti in Los Angeles, because the city tends not to uh, control the port that usually is arrested within it. But in fact, a port is a significant um, a source of emissions. So Auckland and London recently had a call uh, where a single a single uh, cruise ship is, is um, uh, quite a number of cars in equivalent of air quality impact. Um, so because there isn't that power within cities to control the port in, in all different ways, there, there has to be a lot of thinking about how can cities, if working together, diplomatically influence uh, the decisions that international shippers are making and the kind of vessels that come into the port and what they can control and what they can't control. So they're forming a network uh, that includes Los Angeles, Portland, Rotterdam, uh, Auckland and London, uh, just to name just a few, who are coming together to really talk how can they work together to influence the fact that uh, shipping um, and the ports themselves have an influence on their cities. Do governments think about the road design so they can be walking friendly? Or should governments think about the road design so they can be walking friendly? Do you have Abs a yes, absolutely. <laughs> um, and there's been some useful and significant changes in UK government policy recently, but yes, this is, this is so significant because the, the best zero emission transport is Shanks Pony. We do. <laughs> Those who haven't heard that phrase before, please Google it. I last heard that in the mountains on this island in the northwest of Scotland when I landed once and there was how do I get to the hotel and I was told Shanks's pony with a rucksack and a, a bag of stuff. There's a, an island that had no no, ro no roads and no cars. I get people do some googling on that. Um, we've touched on Covid but I'll ask the question, I'm not sure we covered from this direction, has the impact of city lockdowns during the Covid pandemic helped or hindered the medium long term support for zero emission cities? The answer is both. Um, I think it's mainly hindered because it's made, uh, mayors have been distracted, there are less resources to play with, they are more reticent about imposing um, a serious regulation on businesses that might mean uh, short term costs. Um, but on the flip side, people have been able to commit, um, connect with their local communities a lot more, they have experienced what a car free city can be like, um, they have taken up cycling and active mobility. Um, so they have a sense of what it could be like if it was quieter and more easy to cycle, but there is a long road ahead of us um, and it's not going to be easy. Okay, Nico from Zurich, you mentioned, you asked a question about household recycling performance and, and rates and the views of the mayors and why people aren't reacting. I'm gonna be a bit cheeky and ask that you drop me a line away from here, because I think, I think the challenges for recycling rates is a topic in its own right, but I think I would like to touch, but my quick question, do you do, you do get, have policy on waste management, I take it? Yeah. Yes, we do. We have a whole declaration on waste management, so definitely worth looking at our website about it. Uh, and happy if you please, email. Please, Nico, please contact me via the WMG LinkedIn page, please. Um, do you think we should? This is uh, somebody asking for about other emissions like tyre um, from tyres and things like that. So, should we focus on all aspects of environmental emission, not just those from vehicle exhausts? And I think this is a question about the fact that air quality is driven not just by tailpipe emissions, um, but by uh, what we call particulate matter from um, breaking in tire wear. Um, and this is one of the reasons why we advocate for reduced vehicle miles traveled. So trying to reduce the whole, the, the level of vehicles traveling in an area overall is because there's still a, a negative air quality impact. Even if we um, have zero emission vehicles, it's just zero emission of the tail, tailpipe. Tires are still a problem for air quality. I think that's the perspective of the question. And we've answered, we've answered, we've taken about 20, over 20 questions we've taken, by the way, in a half hour. It's, it's, I feel a bit like Andrew Neil, but I'm not nearly paid as much as him, or he was. When we talk about alternative fuels very often, we're looking to the emissions from the engine, in my personal opinion, 
we don't take into consideration that to produce the fuel we need other sources of energy that have emissions too. Am I wrong? When, for example, we say hydrogen is a clean source of energy, do we consider the cost and the environmental impact of producing hydrogen? It's a bit like a nuclear question, isn't it? It is, and this is a murky area. Um, and I think it's always important to understand which is slightly better than the other. So we do need to move away from, from fossil fuels. Um, um, I mean, this is also why I have a preference for, for EVs, but I, I'm not a, a detailed expert. I think it's very important, even when we have a question about biofuels sometimes, it's very important that we, we, we do an, an analysis of what the GHG emissions impact are. Um, we think about what the air quality impact are, but we also think about what is coming to the market and how can we shift it. Um, so we often have a detailed conversation with cities about whether providing uh, incentives for things like biofuels when we intend to probably phase them out in the future is fair or a reasonable thing to communicate to the market. And I think it'd be really good to, to consider that in decisions as well. Uh, what is going to be justifiable in the medium term? The last question which I'm going to take, how can Arsh be a key player in Africa on developing smart cities free from environmental problems? Well, I'll, I'll wear the Irish hat here. The Irish Environment and Waste Management Group is an international organisation, part of IOSH. What I would say is there are other bodies as well. Our Irish will negotiate and work with people. That Irish generally is its members. And we have got a branch in West Africa, or a, sorry, a district in West Africa. Um, we have one branch of it, I think, is in Nigeria and one is in Ghana. So, I mean, Nigeria obviously having a huge population, 120 million is Nigeria, I think. So again, Irish has got people in those places there. Um, so again, but Irish cannot cure the world's problems. And this is, is up to, Irish is the strength of his members. And I would commend the members to actually get involved in the various committees from different parts of the world. And Irish is reviewing its members, its, 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 its groups now around the world. So again, there are chances maybe of how do we actually engage. Okay, so I'll, I'll take that question. It's a very generic off the wall question because I, and Irish did have a, we did actually put together a conference in West Africa, but Irish is primarily is a health and safety organisation. We have this debate where environmental management sits in, in it. No more questions now. That's it. I mean, Kate, you've been brilliant for taking the session here. The fact that num the number of people who dropped out, generally I look at the numbers dropping out of the session, people have stayed. So they've listened to the conversation. And please, anybody still out there who hasn't disappeared off from their one hour lunch break, please put yourself where Kate has been today. You know, we'll have a presentation and a conversation that you, the membership, can lead on. That's really how I want to make these things work. So the, the usual unsocial bit is I'm just going to click the screen, everyone will disappear and go on. But thank you very much for everyone for joining in. Please watch our um, mail shots and information coming out for the next one. And we'll take it from now. I hope to see you all in two or three weeks' time. Take care. Thanks again, Kate. Cheers. Bye-bye, everybody.